Well, good morning. I'm glad you're joining us today. Uh, we are in week three of our series that we're calling Five Smooth Stones. We know that David was chosen by God. Even though he was an unlikely choice, he was chosen. And with God's help, he defeats Goliath in battle with only five smooth stones and a sling. Now, there were certain things that David did to make his effort successful. And if we can understand what David did, we'll be better equipped to be able to defeat the giants in our lives as well. So before we get into that, let's, let's start with a word of prayer. Pray with me. Lord, please help me to take my eyes off of everyone else and simply focus on what you've already given me to work with. Give me faith. Give me courage. And please give me victory as I head into this coming week. Amen. You know, throughout this series, we have focused on the story of David and Goliath. It's a well-known story, but one that we have been spending time unpacking and learning more from. And today, we land on the part of the story that actually mentions these five smooth stones that we've been talking about. And David uses them to, spoiler alert, slay the giant Goliath. Okay? Now, there's an important overarching concept that we must learn today, and it is this, that God wants you to use what you have. Did you guys catch that? God wants you to use what you have. I remember I signed up for a bicycle race when I was in high school with some of my buddies, and my, my buddies were very serious, you know. Uh, I had a pretty good bike, but it wasn't anything fancy. I think I would got it in from Kmart. Um, but some of my friends, they were going to fancy cycling stores. Now, that's how you knew that they were serious, because the stores were called cycling stores. Um, anyway, this was in the early days of the sport, way before people casually dropped $2,000 on a 10-speed uh, road bike, you know, like they do now. But, but, but I had the Lycra shorts, you know, and, and, and I had a little cycling hat, and, you know, I had the right shoes and everything. Anyway, the day came for the race. And I just wasn't very confident because I knew I didn't have all of the pro gear, you know, like my hero, Greg Lamond. And anyway, so we started to ride, and my friends and I, we settled into a good pace as we raced along. And we changed the lead, you know, each one of us would peel off and take the lead for a little while, you know, so that nobody got too tired. It was a really good strategy. But the problem is, is that we were getting resoundly beat by some kid on a huffy. And, and he didn't even have mediocre gear, you know. He was wearing running shorts and Chuck Smith's shoes, you, you know, like Converse shoes. Um, but he had everything that he needed to beat us, right? He had a high lung capacity, a high tolerance for pain, and a real desire to win. You see, if you're anything like me, it's tempting to look at other people's lives, you know, whether in person or on social media, and wish that you had what they had. It's enticing to believe that, it, it, that if you had a better paying job or, or a different zip code or a bigger house that you would be able to finally serve God in the way that he, both you and he wants. This condition is not a unique one. And it's something many of us understand all too well. And we learn from today from our passage that this is a human condition. It goes all the way back hundreds and even thousands of years. The lesson that I learned that day on the bike is that it doesn't matter if you have all of the best gear in the world or that you have all of the right stuff. If it's God's will for you to win the race or minister in the lives of others, he will give you everything that you need to accomplish his will. And the Bible makes it clear that God has given all of his people different gifts. The Holy Spirit helps us see and learn what these gifts are and how God is trying to use them in our lives to better the whole world. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says this, he says, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. 
The same Spirit gives great faith to another, and to someone else the Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from some other spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak unknown languages while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is one, it is the one and only Spirit who distributes all of these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. How differently would this story have gone if David would have spent his time envying those around him in the Israelite army or even the physical strength of Goliath himself? Instead, David was focused on what he had. In this case, it was five smooth stones and a sling. So let's dive into our passage together here this morning. We're going to look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 7, or chapter 17, verses 32 through 40. If you're able to please stand for the reading of scriptures, now is the time to do so. Again, 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 40. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way that you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and and he has been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said, and when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb for the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. I've done this with both lions and bears, and I will do this to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put them on and strapped the sword over it. He took a step or two to see, you know, what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from the stream and he put them in his shepherd's bag. And then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. Now, that was the part of the story that we're going to focus on today, but let's read a little bit further. Let me read a little bit further so that we can understand and better understand the significance of what David brought with him into this fight. So David leaves Saul's armor behind. He picks up the five smooth stones from the river, and then it says that Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer in front of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. He says, am I a dog? He roars at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his own gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the wild and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. But David replied to the Philistine, you come at me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come in you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've defied. Today the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I'll give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, not with a sword or a spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag, he took out a stone and he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in. Goliath stumbled and fell forward face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled out Goliath's sword from its sheath, and David used it to kill him and cut off his head. It's very gross, right? Now there's a lot going on in this passage this morning, but, but there are three specific things I'd like to highlight this morning in regard to to God's call upon David's life to fight Goliath. 
And I believe each of these things is crucial in our own lives as we seek to understand the call and the will and the giftedness that God has given each one here today to fight the giants that we face in our lives. And the first is to block out the white noise. At the beginning of the passage, David declares that he will go and fight Goliath. But as soon as he says this, Saul responds with these words, there's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're just a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. That sounds like a voice that might hold you back, right? Last week we talked about those who would try to hold us back and look down upon us. And there are many in our lives that, regardless of what we do, will try to keep us from where we need to go. This will often come in the form of doubt, right? Similar to what 1 Timothy says, as we referenced last week, that Saul seemed to be looking down on David because of his youth. And, and so what is David supposed to do with all of this? His brother won't have it. Others ignore him, simply just ignore him. And then Saul doesn't think he has any chance at all of success. But to David, this is all just white noise in the midst of God's clear call and his command. White noise refers to the noise that contains all of the frequencies across the sound spectrum of audible sound in equal measure. That's what it is. And because white noise spans multiple bands of sound, it's sometimes referred to as broadband noise. Anecdotally, people liken white noise to the static sound that comes from an untuned radio or a television. And researchers have studied over the years the effects of white noise on humans and finding evidence that it can reduce crying in infants, it improves work performance, and potentially helps counteract the symptoms of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD. Um, it's been proven to increase focus in some and decrease focus in others. I, for example, have a hearing problem. I wear hearing aids. And if I'm somewhere with an excess of white noise, especially mechanical white noise like refrigerator condensers or air conditioners, I cannot hear very well. It's like there are too many voices in my head and I'm unable to differentiate or focus on any one of those. You see, in a spiritual sense, there will be many voices around you begging for the airtime in your life. And if you aren't careful, you can get bogged down and overwhelmed by them. This is why it's so important for you to, to learn to discern God's voice from all of the others. You have to drown out the white noise. And we've learned how to sort through the different voices in our life, right? We've been talking about this with the help of the Holy Spirit. And this requires us to ask certain questions of the voices that we hear. For example, you could ask questions like, does this voice actually care about me? Is this a godly voice? Does this voice hold wisdom? And it's questions like these that help us to discern which voice to ultimately listen to and trust. In David's life and his story, it is clear from the text that he was able to shake off the words of Saul and others and stay focused on what God was inviting him into. So let's take another look at 1 Samuel 17, verses 34 and 36. This is what it says. But David persisted and he said, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. And when a lion comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club, and I rescue the lamb from its mouth, and if the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw, and I club it to death. And I've done this to both lions and bears, and I will do this to this Philistine, this pagan Philistine too. These words, they just give you confidence, right? They just give you confidence. David is so focused on the task at hand, it gives people around him confidence. He is oozing with it. You see, David's bravado comes from past experiences as a shepherd in the wilderness. He has seen God deliver him time and time again from wild beasts, and he has no doubt that God will do it again in this present situation. And that brings us to number two. Remember where you've been. There are so many stories in the Bible of individuals being prepared for their future um, by their present circumstances and suffering. Take Joseph, for example, in the book of Genesis. He was falsely imprisoned in a foreign land, and yet he ended up in the Egyptian palace. God was clearly on the move throughout Joseph's whole story. 
whether others could see it or not. In fact, the story of Joseph concludes with really powerful words that reveal God's work in his life in the story. In Genesis chapter 50, verses 19 through 20, it says, But Joseph replied to his brothers, Don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. God was with Joseph all along, just as God is with David all along. And reality is the same for us today. Even in the, se- even in the seasons when you cannot feel it, God is with you. So even today, maybe the first step in learning to understand God's call upon your life is by looking backwards. There is a consistent command in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, and that command is to remember. We see this in Deuteronomy 8.2. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness these 40 years humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Remembering where we've been is meant to give us strength and confidence in where we are right now. Seeing God work in and through our past gives us strength and confidence for whatever we face today. And as we stand in that confidence, we can say like David did in verse 37, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion And the paw of the bear will rescue me from the paw of this Philistine as well. What David held in his hands and in his heart was a collective memory of all that God had done for him up to that point. Before he ever picks up those stones out of the river and puts them with his sling, he already carried the memories of deliverance and triumph from his young life. So you can see in the story that when Saul tries to weigh David down with this new armor and this sword, David, he'd have none of that. He'd have none of that. Which brings us to the last point. He had all that he needed. Then Saul gave David the armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. He put it on, uh, he put it on, he strapped the sword over, he took a step or two to see what it was like because he'd never worn such things. I can't go out in these, he protested. I'm not used to them. So David took them all off and he picked up his five smooth stones from the stream. He put them into his shepherd's bag and off he went. I love how the text is showing David trying to fit into the mold of a proper soldier, fitted with this helmet and armor and the sword, and he proceeded to walk around in them. Thankfully, he quickly recognized that the new outfit wasn't going to work. It wasn't going to help him in this battle that he had to fight. He was, just as he arrived, sufficiently prepared to face Goliath. He didn't need all of that extra stuff. In fact, it would have only hindered him. Have you ever played dress up, when, you know, like when you were a kid? You tried to impersonate another person. Maybe you dressed up like a fireman or a policeman um, when you were a kid. My, my cousin Greg and I, we used to dress like, like we were in the army and, you know, play war in the backyard. We'd get all dressed up in the stuff that we had bought from the Army-Navy surplus store and basically stormed the beach of war at his house in San Diego. And I I just remember doing that with him and it being so much fun. But we we must have looked like David in 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 all that armor with helmets and stuff that didn't really fit our little heads. I also remember when I was starting out as a pastor, I used to become really impressed with other pastors that were out there, and sometimes I'd try to emulate them in in the way that they preached or in how they would approach a text or something, and I tried to do that like they did, but you know what? It didn't work. It never works when you're trying to be somebody that you're not. Many of us are trying to fit into someone else's clothing or story or situation in order to better live our own lives, but like David learned... We don't need all of that. In fact, all that you presently have in your possession is all that you need to sufficiently serve God. This principle reminds me of the time that Jesus fed 5,000 people with something like a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. In fact, let's take a look at that story. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 14 here. As soon as Jesus heard the news, he left the boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed, and they followed on foot from many towns. And Jesus saw this huge crowd, and he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. 
That evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. But we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass, and Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up towards heaven, and he blessed them. And then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave them bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. And they all ate as much as they wanted, and afterwards the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day, in addition to all of the women and the children. When the disciples began to worry about how to feed all of the people, Jesus simply asked them to gather together what they already had. Now, obviously, in the story, Jesus performs a miracle and he feeds thousands of people with five loaves of bread and two fish. But what if that's exactly what God is trying to teach us today through the story of David and Goliath? What if God is trying to help you see the miraculous things that he can do in your life when you simply bring him the ordinary, everyday stuff that you have to offer. David put aside all of the extra stuff that Saul had given him, and he grabbed five smooth stones and a sling. He added to that faith, he added to that the faith that he had developed over time, serving God and his family in the wilderness. He walked into the battle with Goliath. And through all the white noise, and through all of the doubt, and through all of the fear, He went into victory. All he had was all that God had already given him. It was all that he needed. It's powerful to start believing you have everything that you need. There are a lot of us here today who feel trapped in an endless loop of white noise. There are too many voices, too many options, too many experiences of shame and regret and defeat for us to confidently move ahead with all that God has for us. And if that sounds like you today, then I encourage you to do all that you can do to shut out all of those other things and simply focus on God. Try to have, like David did, a singularly focused mind on the power and the majesty of God. Try to become the person after the very heart of God. Others of you have simply forgotten all that God has done in your past to get you where you are today. And if that's you, then please sit down and take some time to write out the miracles that God has already worked out in your life on your behalf. Your testimony, that's your superpower. Don't ever forget that. And lastly, all of us, all of us need to stop looking at everything everyone else has and just access what he's already given us. We need to focus on what God has given us to work with. You have gifts that are individual and unique to you. Maybe it's time for you to pick them up and head into the victory that God has before you. You already have all that you need. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for this message that you have given us everything we need to be successful in the battles that you lead us into. And whatever giants that we're facing in our lives right now, whether that's a loss of a job or depression or anxiety or a difficult diagnosis or a failed marriage or whatever we're facing right now, Lord, You have given us everything that we need to be able to face that giant and win. Lord, help us to remember how you've met us along the way, leading us up to the point that we are at right now. And let us have faith in you, for you are powerful and strong and will lead us to victory. In Jesus' name, amen.